Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you see a little link down below, you can click on it and you'll end up in Zoom. Uh, if you click on that link that you see in Zoom, you'll end up in Mukana, and there you become a producer. You're actually driving the show. Um, this show is driven by everyone asking questions and voting on those questions and deciding not only what we're going to talk about, but when we're going to talk about it. So that's um, that's really a very one of the most important parts of this show, maybe the most important part. So please jump into Mukana and ask those questions and vote on those questions. If you'd uh, if you'd like to actually answer those questions and be part of the panel, you need to be here by 6:40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's when we do the mic checks. Now, <clears throat> sorry, if you're not sure if you're ready for the mic checks or you just want to hang out, we open the doors at six o'clock. So you can uh, you can jump in a little early and uh, and just make sure that everything's working and hang out and talk to us about whatever we're randomly talking about between six and six forty a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, at seven o'clock, we start the general conversation. Uh, just any question you have around media or virtual production, and then at the second hour, uh, and sometimes the second and third hour, as today, we take something that we think is a little bit more important that we'd like to spend a little more time on. Today is the education hour, or education two hours, roughly. And uh, we just, we're digging into really nuts and bolts of how to rethink the way we do education. So we're going to be brainstorming on that. As a note, that won't be on YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, this will end at the end of this hour. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we're talking there that we decided not to put on, on YouTube. So, so anyway, so note, note that. Um, at three o'clock, uh, we start Mad in the Kitchen. So you'll start to hear the buildup of, um, of all the locations and getting ready for, ready for the event and so on and so forth. You can get into that by, by actually, uh, you know, there's a, in the email that we send out, uh, you, you'll actually see a place where you can sign up for that meeting. It's not the same meeting as this one. But you'll get to listen to Mad in the Kitchen. At 5 o'clock, the show starts. And after the show, we'll do a little postmortem, talk about what worked and what didn't work. Um, also, a, a, a reminder that there is a, if you'd like to join any of the, the Office Hour production uh, teams, everything from, you know, just overall management, uh, doesn't whatever skill set you have that you'd like to bring into it, uh, let us know. Uh, and uh, there's a, there's the Q&A or the form for that is in the emails that go out in the morning. So um, if it's something you're interested in, uh, go ahead and jump on that and, and uh, fill that out. We're going to kind of start taking the production of office hours to another level over the summer as we get ready for the fall. And so you'll see us working on that a lot next week. And if you want to be part of some of those programs, um, just let us know. All right, let's uh, jump into the questions. Take the con, sir. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, first one's coming in from Carmi Vineswig in Redondo Beach, California. What are the biggest disadvantages of using headsets versus stand-mounted microphones that has so many people pick up the latter over the former for use on office hours and or general Zoom calls? Go ahead, Leo, and then Sky. So I'm on a headset today because uh, I'm traveling, um, and I haven't got enough ears. Things keep falling off my ears all the time. So I've got headset on, I've got my ears in, I've got my glasses. When I walk out with a mask as well, so everything is just falling off. There's too many things falling off you my head. You see more ears. The, the, the answer is more ears. Uh, go ahead, Sky. I've, this is an early purchase. This is a Countryman, which for a headset mic is great. But this was before we discovered that the, the dual ear will keep it more uh, locked into location. Mm -hmm. And then the Pile and the Polsons came along. They're not as higher quality, but they were pretty good for the price. So mm -hmm. good. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I tried an RF uh, headset. We all know how that went and uh, <laughs> it's sitting over here still, but yeah, uh, yeah. I thought it'd be great because it had a 300 foot range, but range is not the main criteria. And go ahead, TJ. I think part of the um, issue is with a broadcast or you know radio microphone or whatever t sometimes you tend to get a, a bit more sound you get a bit a fuller sound rather you get a bit more off-axis noise rejection for some things and depending on the individual some people don't like to have the look of the the boom from the mic arm coming in and depending on the mic you specifically choose some have an adjustment where you can get it to the right spot some don't and so you end up with the, the mic right in front and you get a lot of plosives and sometimes you, you just hear somebody breathing a lot right uh, george and then mark so the pr40 is pretty good for what we do in office hours but when i'm doing production work i use the dpa boom that way i have a clear path in front of me of my stream decks and so forth, and this doesn't restrict what I need to uh, do. Go ahead, Mark. 
Yeah, certainly mobility. This was last Thursday night on a live stream in this room. Um, I had NDI iOS cameras in here to turn to. And when I turn over here and start talking to a camera that was over here, you're not hearing me so well. But if I had, I immediately thought of Guy's headset. <laughs> a $600 price tag, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Jason and then Leo. Yeah, it sounds uh, kind of weird, but style. Um, I've noticed that most people that are working corporate or in education, government use, try and use headsets, whereas more production individuals use uh, microphones on stands. Yeah, go ahead, Leo. So taking that forward, um, I find that for talent, actually giving them headset microphones has been a big advantage because they don't know how to present to a microphone. Right. And if at the end of the day, we're not actually, the look is important, but the sound is even more important. And um, if they can't, if we, if people can't hear them because they don't realize they're not presenting to the microphone, uh, that's a big problem. And it's a quick fix in yeah, we, certain people who bounce around a stage. Yeah, you know, we send out headsets as a general, general op op option because with labs, we don't know what their room is like. And we might pick up a lot of their room with, um, you know, with shotguns, same thing. Uh, and with radio mics, they have to know how to address them. So the easiest thing to do it takes a little bit of them setting them up. <laughs> so, and if they have long hair, we had one yesterday with them. It just became part of their hair, which was a little, little rough. Um, but uh, uh, but but once you get it on, uh, they just it doesn't require much skill, and it tends to just solve the a lot of the issues that you'd have with a normal room. Go ahead, Peter. I was going to say. I mean, I I have a radio mic that I was using early on with office hours, yeah. and. I, and then as COVID got worse and worse and worse, and I was spending eight to nine hours in front of my computer, I said, for a variety of reasons, one is I could lean back and the headset mic will follow me. Right. The, the radio mic will not follow me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when I, a lot of times when I'm doing training or if I'm doing something, I'm moving around, I like to have a headset mic because, because I'm moving my head around that. And I think Mark talked about that a little bit down below, you know, when, when you're working on, on that process. But uh, when one of the reasons that I use it is because, you know, I've decided that this is primarily a radio show with some video. And so as a result, I want it to sound as close to radio as possible. Uh, an enormous number of people that, that are part of this show are actually listening to it. I listen to it when I'm not here. You'll see my little my little thing pop up. I'm making breakfast, or I'm working out a couple things, or I'm planning out what we're going to do here, and uh, and I'm listening to the show. And so having great mics really makes it a lot easier. Go ahead, Mark. Real quick, a headset is not likely to be used as a pointer. I had a secondary handheld mic once and gave it to a presenter at the front of a room speaking to an audience right. in that room and started taking the handheld and started pointing to the PowerPoint on the screen yeah. like this. I'm like, oh. No, that's not going to work. <laughs> All right. Uh, G, 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 do you have something to add there? I thought you had your hand up there. No? All right. Next question. Next one's coming in from Tim Mann in Langware in uh, Australia. Is there a way to save the ATEM Mini Pro streaming XML to the device, including stream keys? For example, two different groups, YouTube keys, plus another for BoxCast. Go ahead, John. Not that I have found within the ATEM software control, but if I show you the companion uh, interface real quickly, you can actually set up destinations within companion and um, just about in the background you can maybe see my ATEM software control and what I've done is just changing between different destinations here using a set streaming service uh, command so that is a way to do it but it's maybe not the exact way that you might want to do it uh, next question I think Jonas had oh Jonas I'm sorry I didn't see it go ahead um, the ATEM can only store one and then you need to push it again that's the problem there mm. I tried with the SDK. Next question. Next one's coming in from Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas, producer extraordinaire. Uh, any favorite production related non sci fi movies? Uh, go ahead, Jason. Content beware, but six days to air. Uh, it's the making of South Park. It's how they make the show and put the show together in six days. The. the... Any favorite production-related non-sci-fi movies? I'm just trying to... Uh, what, what do you mean by that, Rupert? Well, I, I, I like movies that might involve the production of a TV show, you know, like a true oh. story, behind the scenes, anything like that, or live streaming for that matter. Got it, got it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed was a lot of the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, podcasts, you know, about their production, I thought was really, really well done. Um, go ahead, Jeffrey, and then JJ. 
Uh, non sci fi, uh, I think it's Life of Pi, the one about the, the kid in the boat with the tiger. And it, just on the sci fi, they just came out with Netflix had this army of the dead about Vegas zombies. And they did a whole bunch of LIDAR stuff to remap Vegas. And that's a pretty good watch. Go ahead, JJ, and then Sky. There was the um, uh, director of Boondock Saints, Troy Duffy. There's a, a commentary regarding the, the making of that. Uh, if you're looking for something about production, the production of that film, the Boondock Saints, it's a mm -hmm. documentary on what broke down. Go ahead, Sky. The director uh, commentary for the, the animated film Wall E, the Pixar film, that if you can find the DVD or the Blu-ray or something, it, but with the director's uh, commentary right. behind it, was was insightful and brilliant. Also, um, on the production as a show, what was it called? Network, the the origin of um, well, I mean, it was it was, it was not a documentary, obviously, right. but it was uh, a, a great show about news production. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but running with the with the kind of behind the scenes. The, the, the ones that I've used a lot in classes, so when I teach and I want to talk about these, um, are the Criterion release of Armageddon, the Criterion release, or the, um, the extended releases of Lord of the Rings, Matrix, the white, when you have Take the White Rabbit, if you, if, if, for those of you who remember that, you got to click on the white rabbit, and uh, um, that is the, it's pretty, pretty good behind the scenes that you can learn a lot from. Um, the, uh, some of the Star Wars stuff is, you know, is relatively good. The Mandalorian the newer one is the the Mandalorian motion. Um, the uh, when they were talking about how to do the Mandalorian ship, and they showed how you know they built a motion con re rebuilt from scratch a motion control arm or motion control system. The the old fashioned ILM. Uh, the that fifteen minutes is some of the best behind the scenes I've seen in a long time. So um, so those are those are I think a couple places that are. Those are some of the ones that I used a lot. There's a lot of breakdowns. Criterion does a lot of them. Traffic is also traffic um, as a behind the scenes. The Criterion release of traffic is amazing. Um, they have they show a whole Avid setup where they they literally they show you the scene and how they're building it inside of an Avid um, and breaking it down. They talk about the film processing. They talk about the microphones and how the you know uh, you know there's just so much stuff that they really you know dig into. So I the only reason I buy so many movies is just to watch the behind the scenes. So I <laughs> I watch a lot of them, uh, but those are the ones that that stand out in my in my head. Let's jump on to the next question. Next one's coming in from Leo Mandel in London, UK. The Facebook porters are all, are all on sale. I think it's a Memorial Day sale, uh, and they're about a hundred pounds. What's that equal U.S.? Uh, I think it's about a hundred bucks too on the ten inch U.S. Does the Portal TV also do the Zoom Room bump? And has anyone used one for an office meeting room setup? Go ahead, Ken. Uh, oops. Nope. No, you were you were you were good there a second ago, and then you the Stream Deck. This, yeah. As Alex says, yes, yeah, <laughs> the notorious Stream Deck mute unmute. Yeah. Um, yes to both. I, I, I use. Um, I always have it one mounted up here, so whenever I'm doing a Facebook, um, sorry, uh, a meeting, I right. I put that on, and that gives you the bump, and yeah. you then you can then put it back to the waiting room. Yeah, I did. I did get a portal for our, some of our cooking tests, and I found it to be pretty useful. I mean, it does a pretty good job of following you around um, and and making it work. And so, um, it's a it's a pretty slick device. I have to admit, though, that I I unplug it every time I'm done with the cooking thing. Like I'm like, I will not have you just sitting around listening. So I so I um, I you know I plug it in, I do the thing, and then I turn it off and put it back in its box. And then the box is just still sitting there, and I just put it away. You know. So, uh, go ahead, Leo. It looks like the sale is actually on for a month, uh, so it will probably be the first product that hasn't been mentioned in office hours that sells out instantly. <laughs> no, next question. Another one coming in from Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas, and he asks, uh, Neat makes some high-profile, high-dollar Zoom room devices. Anyone seeing them in the wild? He's got a link there, Jeffrey. Well, yeah, go ahead, Jonas. They look a bit, uh, a lot like the Logitech devices that Zoom actually uh, provide or uh, recommends. So maybe they just repackage them or do uh, hardware as a service instead of just providing the hardware. But they look interesting. Yeah, that looks really interesting. I mean, it looks like they really, uh, yeah. I have not used them, but they, they look cool. My, my question will always be when you see these little webcams, it's like, yeah, that's great. Let's see how the chip works. We'll see what the optics are like. That you know, I feel like they, 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 a lot of times we see these built out and then we don't see 
the investment that Logitech has made in the chipset and the and the optics. Go ahead, uh, Rupert, and then Leo. So on the neat side, I just encountered them um, a few weeks ago online. Uh, it looks like they were, had a keynote at uh, Zoomtopia last year, maybe. Um, but if you look it up online, it's a pretty impressive presentation. Yeah, yeah it looks cool. Uh, go ahead, Leo. Uh, they were, there's been a couple of, in the Houses of Worship forums, there have been some discussions about whether they could be used for that environment. And the feedback has been they're great for five or six people in the room but when you start trying to if you think you're going to get away with using that for 30 people in a hybrid environment it's not going to work uh, but also my uh, i had a call from zoom a couple of weeks ago from my zoom account manager and they're pushing that device as well it looks pretty useful you know as far as for a you know to, to tie in uh, an office area you know to make that work so it's, it's it, could, it could be useful yeah, absolutely next question Next one's coming in from John Barker in Malmo, Sweden. Has anyone used AWS slash cloud production to run a show that they were also a panelist on? Any learnings to share about delay or setups? And yes, I meant to ask this yesterday. So you're talking about about um, you're on the panel and you're running the show. Is that is that? Actually, even more specifically, I, I want to move my live stream, weekly live stream into the cloud whenever I have guests so that I don't have to rely on bringing them in. I did one a few weeks ago and I had one guest, but ideally I would have multiple and I kind of want to push that into the cloud, but I want to be a part of the show and actually switch the show too so that I can continue to be learning as I go. I mean, it seems like very close to what we've been doing in vMix, you know, or, or what Guy and what we, I say we, but I have not been doing it no, yet. yet. Uh, but what Guy and, and other folks have been doing related to putting it in there and George. Go ahead, George. So, John, I find that I've been using vMix call to bring guests in. And what I've been doing lately is just bringing myself in in vMix call also. That way I don't have that much latency between myself and them because before I was using just my camera going in directly to my local vMix, but then that create a additional delay. So I just joined a call, uh, vMix call now and just use it that way. But I haven't had any issues doing it that way. And you're doing it, you're participating that way in the cloud, in vMix, and then how are you, I think that the audio always trips me up, like how are you listening to all those audio sources as well as being part of it? Well, I'm using, um, locally I'm using loopback to just route it back. And I haven't really had any mm -hmm. issues, and that's that's how I do all my demos for clients right. also. Okay. Yeah, we're going the other way, which is I'm trying to find more people. <laughs> so, and, and, and you know, the, the thing that that uh, y what we're you know what we're going to play with is this kind of very distributed uh, production pipeline, you know, and as a group. And so, so I think that, that I find that as a host, I want to think about as I don't even do the production on this show, <laughs> you know, like guys answering the questions, and Sky is is uh, you know cutting the show and. And other people, you know, and, and there's lots of other people that are kind of, you know, Chad is making sure people are, are routed in the right place. And we've got, you know, TJ and Jeffrey bringing people into the show. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of um, different people, you know, kind of processing that. And, and I think, I mean, I, I get that we can't all do that, but I, but I think that we want to think about as a group, I will say that um, we want to think about supporting each other's shows that way. Um, especially when for the ones that, you know, if they're not making generating revenue, if they're just, you know, us doing this, because I think that we all learn how to do this. You know, I think that we're about to, I, I believe that with some of the shows that all of us are working on and what office hours is about to do over the summer, we're going to start redefining broadcast, you know, like it's going to change. I think by the fall, things are going to, People are going to start going. I don't understand how that even works. <laughs> you know, like, like you know, and and um, you know, we're the only ones in the world that can do that right now, in my opinion. Like, I think we've gotten to a point where there's nobody else with the number of people that can be part of the process and part of the conversation as as we have here. And so we have a unique opportunity to kind of, um, you know, the easiest way to predict the future is to create it. You know, and I think we're about in a position to create it. And I think we should look at each other's, as supporting each other's um, shows. You know, and we've done that with. Um, with Matt in the kitchen, I think that with what, what a lot of us are doing here, we should look at how how different people in the group can support other people during their different shows, and maybe someday we turn it into a network. But but the 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 goal is is to is to kind of figure it out because we we get to learn how to do it as well. And the only way to learn this is not to. I mean, it's great that we all get up here and talk about it all the time, and we can read articles and everything else. But how you learn is doing. You know, you do 
you may, you, 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 and then you discuss. <laughs> so you fail, you discuss, go out and fail again, come back and discuss some more. Um, go ahead, Jonas. So knowing your show a bit, since you probably would have a, like a starting piece where you talk, if you bring in yourself um, also over Zoom and not a stream SRT app, because then you would need to delay all the Zoom feeds. What I would do is like do a scene for you and when you want to show stuff so you can do everything local with your ATEM. And as soon as you go over to like three people, two people, four people, have that as a scene. And what I then have seen, which is pretty amazing, is using Zoom OSC to detect the ad active speaker. And then their picture gets larger and the uh, lower thirds get flown in. So mm -hmm. you don't actually have to produce it because mm -hmm. then you can host the show instead of, oh, yeah, no, I, he's talking and then, yeah. Yeah, good. Go ahead, uh, Chad, and then Paul, and then Guy. Al, so your question about handling audio when you're a vMix caller in it, you'd have all callers on master and bus A, and then all callers but you on bus B, and you're just sending yourself bus B. So it's, and vMix does the mix minus for all the other callers. So it keeps you in the production pipeline as well. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, Alex, how long does it take to develop a show? And I like the concept of office hours as an accelerator for shows. How, how long does it take from beginning to production? For, for office hours? Not very long. No, for a show, just to say, <laughs> to a, say if you I know, wanted to do a news show and an interview people, how long would it take for me to... You can do it tomorrow. I mean, it's not that's not the issue. The, the, the real issue is, is that you... Uh, you can definitely start a show very quickly. Um, the, the main thing is, is if you go towards, con the more you do conversation, the less pre-production there is for the show. It generates the content on its own. What takes a long time is when people feel like they need scripts. You know, they say they need scripts and they need teleprompters and they need things to say. All the things that the viewers don't actually care about and don't want to listen to, um, they, they seem to want to spend a lot of time writing. And so uh, what people really want is authentic communication, you know, and, and I feel like the live talking to people live is a waste of all of our time you know like so so if i want to talk to people i'm going to put that up as a vod you know that way they can and and, and i think partially I, I think that way because i'm i, I if you're around me I, I can be patient at times but when i'm moving i'm just like talk faster i need you to talk faster i need you to talk faster i need you to talk faster you know and when i watch youtube it's really nice with vod's because i just set it to 2 2.0 2.0 2. you know like i'm listening to everything at at 2x you know and that's how I, my brain is just kind of used to working and it actually is easier for me to listen to it at 2x because if it's anything less than 2x i'm having like six thoughts between every thought that's coming out of the out of the screen and so cuz my add is actually um, less a problem at higher at higher uh, bit rates, <laughs> you know. So, so, um, and I've, I've just realized that that's that's a you know. Anyway, so so for me, I don't want people to. I want us to have a conversation. That's why we're here live is to have a conversation. You know, uh, as I as I troll on <laughs> for minutes talking about we should have a conversation. Anyway, go ahead, guy, and then Peter. Yeah, knowing from John Barker's session where he mentioned that he's on uh, cellular out there, kind of in the sticks, um, this is a great example of when to use the cloud for something like this, where yeah. you get that resiliency of the of the instance up there sitting, Absolutely. taking in these feeds, and you don't have to worry about if you fall out, the show can still go on, especially if you have a backup person to cut it. So that's a, a, a thing that StreamYard actually does, which I was going to pass it to Leo here in a sec to mention because that's kind of what we're doing with vMix. It's a high high end StreamYard, and mm -hmm. StreamYard just got you know acquired for twenty five million bucks. I mean, it wasn't real money; it was uh, stock in uh, Hop in. I believe was it twenty five so, million or two hundred fifty million? I think it was another another zero. What, another there, zero. Well, yeah, uh, I think Leo, Leo, you want to talk about how you're using StreamYard? I know you're a big yeah. fan. Go ahead, yeah, Leo, so, and, uh, and then Mark. well, on, on the on the first thing on that uh, the founder of Hopin got announced with who is a, a billionaire um, the, in the two two years it's taken him to become a bit a UK billionaire uh, for the it's all on paper at the moment right. but I think you're absolutely right the, the the key if you if you're looking for low input or low uh, lift to get into there using StreamYard has been incredibly good for doing that and it does every single bit that you've just talked about if you want to control how the the look and the feel of works, you're not going to get it out of StreamYard the way you're going to get it out of vMix, but it does do a huge amount. But I think the biggest thing that I would say, go back to what Alex was saying, is 
the best shows are when I've called people who are in this room and other people to be part of the production and and having some degree of talk back uh, I personally use uh, discord but I know that you use unity for a lot of things the quality of the program just goes straight out the roof when you've got somebody else John to be able to say I just put your phone on just put a mute and say can you please sort this out because I can't deal with this I'm produced I'm on there the quality just goes up and up and up don't do it all yourself in broadcast the most important thing if you're hosting or if you're in front of a camera is being present you know just being present not doing anything else like you, if people will tell you like if, if you text me trying to tell me something about the show during office hours i'm not going to see it until after office hours because i'm not looking at my text i'm not looking at discord i'm not looking at anything i'm, I'm barely looking at the questions because i have someone else doing that and so it is now i can in zen we would argue that that the uh, the most important thing in life is to be present <laughs> so but but we'll just we'll just keep it in the box of of uh, of of this um, of of broadcast, but but the but the point is is that is that all of those separate you know those those separate conversations are creating commas, you know. So you have all these commas that get created while you're trying to figure something else out because definitely as a broadcaster you cannot uh, do more than one thing at a time. And so having the conversation is what what you want to have. Um, and again, I I think that as a lot of these little sprouts start coming out of office hours, uh, many of us sh should take advantage of the opportunity to, um, you know, to learn from each other and help each other do this stuff and be part of it. Because I think this is the, uh, there's a cauldron here that is about to create, you know, something brand new. Uh, go ahead, Mark. I kind of consider what we're talking about right now is the marrow of what's really exciting. And one of the reasons I keep tuning, tuning into this program, it's been a few weeks, uh, maybe it was on a replay, Alex, but I heard you say something that caused uh, a, a shift of thought in my mind because i have a background in television news and everything you know lower thirds and uh, reveals and animations and fast flickering images that keep us from uh, I, uh, theoretically from reaching for the remote but what you said on this particular show was really nothing beats this yeah. with yeah. with nothing in the way and yeah. for that reason i stopped showing my little quick show open even you know the show open mm -hmm. used to be what 30 seconds and they said five seconds eventually that's long enough and now it's like okay do i even need a show open really what we need is right. this and i find whether it's in a program like this or even one in the telework environment and having my morning huddles with teams that i work with right. that this community thing that rises up in this familiarity is what yeah. really is a gateway to enriching content where we it's more authentic and we learn more together so yeah, and, and, i'm really and, hearing and, you and you know we're going to start experimenting with adding graphics back into this conversation but not in a way that's flashy not in the way that we're not, we're not trying to do anything to impress people we're trying to improve the conversation like how do we now now that we've figured out the conversation part how do we make it just easier to watch you know and and, and have it just pop in and give you extra information and, and the things that make it even more engaging but what we're not doing is any well we're going to attempt to not <laughs> do any anything that's overly flashy other than it needs to helps tell the story for the viewer um, as, as we move forward. Go ahead, Sky, and then Peter. I just, Paul, I know you watched the CNN thing about the history of uh, the late night. And consequently, that as a documentary is one of the clearest things that I really learned, if nothing else, to Alex's point, how maybe to not do something. But mm -hmm. again, Alex is, as he's saying, kind of creating a new a nutrient rich environment for people to communicate and connect in that 30 year ago history, the three broadcast networks were the main thing. Comedy central was trying to figure and find a whole new way of, of doing a thing. So that, that CNN historical document is, is pretty critical to uh, and we, and they, how, how they did things then. And we it's have to remember extraordinary, that, extraordinary right. show, extraordinary right. series. Well, one of the things that we have to remember is, is just, you know, how much of our broadcast experience was generated by the limitations of when it was created. So you can't bring people in all over the world. You can't, you don't have zero latency. You don't have all these other things that we have right now. And so um, I think that we're just getting our heads around what that might be. Go ahead, Peter. I was just going to circle. I was just going to circle back to Paul's original question. And, and one of the things I know, because I've been uh, having conversations with a with a couple of people on the panel is you need to know your audience because you need to understand both the limitations of that audience and in some cases limitations about what you can do in front of that audience right absolutely but we're just getting to the beginning the, 
Well, I mean, you do it. You do it here quite deliberately because it's clean show. Right. That's and that's that's my well, point. Well, there's a bunch of things that that there are some generalities. You know, I I always um, uh, there's some generalities of people think that they need to have certain things, and I'm just kind of like, well, do you? Do you really need to like do, do people will people you know being edgy you know is is an edgy show um and a, or a highly con, you know combative show is something some some people want but usually it's a small percentage <laughs> you know like most people just want to have a conversation about the things that they're interested in well, you know, well and, and i but i also do a lot of stuff for un, the under 18 crowd for my work with the boy scouts and i mean there are some laws that well, engage no, no, but 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 well. but even then, even then, um, I, I think people get caught up in the culture of of a certain thing, and they're trying to be something that that they may or may not be. But but I think that the thing is, is that fundamentally, when people are really passionate about something, they don't need all that other stuff. <laughs> that when they're passionate, when we're talking about what they're passionate about, it just kind of that solves itself. And and there's and what you don't want at that point is to have any distractions. You don't want to carve people out if people are interested in media or if they're interested in cooking or if they're passionate about working in their car they don't need all the shiny stuff they just want to know how to do the thing you know or they want to have that conversation what you don't want to do is subdivide that at all that's why we don't have politics we don't have swearing we don't have religion is because those things tend to subdivide people and they, they have a bunch of they, they just don't handle that well um and so uh so you know just why do it you know it doesn't it's, it's not going to gain you anything go ahead rupert so I was just thinking, uh, you know, office hours we keep it pretty uh, tight and uh, protein rich, and uh, just so many, so much other content, you know, has dead air or whatever. And I just think that's basically, you're, as a creator or a publisher, you're just, you're just wasting your audience's time. So I think shows like this have a um, great respect for um, and there's a, the time from your there, audience. There's a uh, thing that I, I work. We also want to have some spice and have some fun fun things. So there are things that we'll laugh about and talk about here and talking about the lower Fenwicks and the, and the, uh, you know, that costs a Charles or a Mickey or whatever. And we have a lot of fun and, and, and the key is not to lose that either. And I have a tendency to, you know, make it high protein, but I also realize that we have to make it fun as well. And so, and that's also part of the pre-show and the pre-pre-show. And that's why we have Sky. <laughs> All right. All right. Next question. Next one's coming in from Jason Seip, but man, that was a long detour on uh, John Barker. Well, Barker's if, if people understand, uh, we're, we're kind of wandering around through these because there aren't that many questions, and so we're not, we're not in a rush. When, when you add a, when the producers put a ton of questions in there, you'll notice that we're just cutting through it because I'm worried about running out of time at the hour. When you're not asking a lot of questions, we're just going to chew on it. And I don't think there's anything wrong. I think it's just a different pace. But yeah, know I that I'm Sunday always there for a minute. What? <laughs> I had to check my watch. I thought yeah, it was yeah, Sunday yeah. if we were going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Next, next question. Jason Seip, Myriad of California. Where and how do you implement XML in your production workflow? I was waiting for John Barker to raise his hand for some reason, but because he's, but um, you know, the XML uh, is the XML is an instruction set. A lot of times that we use in a lot of different things, or it holds that that instruction set. So the instruction sets of the ATEM, uh, you know, are an XML file. The Final Cut is an XML file. Uh, you know, motion is an XML file. How we run our elementals are all XML files. So they, there's an XML file that's saved out by our encoder that is all the settings. That need, and you can literally go in and just change those settings in the text. And it's going to load up and be something different. And so those are some of the ways that we use it. Uh, go ahead, JJ, and then Rupert, and then Chad. Well, not only in production workflow, but in anything else, like everything. Whenever I'm trying to figure out how anything works, I go look at the XML to figure out what the direction set are, how, how it functions in the programming. It's a lot, it's much easier for a person like me rather yeah. than looking at a GUI to see what the mm -hmm. output is. Yeah, go ahead, Rupert, and then Chad. So again, not exactly in production, but uh, sometimes on the Ubiquity equipment, you can export your configuration in XML and sometimes then do some changes that you can't do through the UI in the, in, in the XML and then re-upload it. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Chad. In vMix, I have scripts that I use to fade to mute and return where I have to store a level and be able to recall it later on. We do that in XML, referencing XPass. And John Mahoney with the Streaming Alchemy Show has been doing a lot of videos on uh, where he's exploiting XML documents in vMix to be able to do some fancy things. Yeah, I right, go ahead, John, do it. When I do uh, API calls via a lot of scripts that I write for work, 
we get back the responses in JSON, which is a, very similar to XML. And so you can programmatically display that stuff quite easily using uh, scripting. So it's useful for data returns as well as, um, as well as configuration. Next question. Next one's coming in from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. Uh, can you watch Apple Fitness Plus without an Apple TV, i.e. watch it full screen? Has anyone tried AFP? Go ahead, TJ. Uh, yeah, you do not need an Apple TV to watch Apple Fitness Plus, but you do need an Apple Watch to use At least once. Fitness Plus. <laughs> and then I've done it. I've used it uh, on my Apple TV. I've done it on my iPhone, and I've done it on my iPad, depending on what workout I'm mm -hmm. doing on which piece of equipment I'm doing it on. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, I think you just need the watch once to log in and get going, because then it says, I can't find your watch. Do you still want to do the workout? And you go, sure. So I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, go ahead, TJ. Uh, on the Apple TV, every single time you have to pair your watch to the TV. It is oh, a bit annoying, but. On your phone, you don't need to do that. So you, so I, because I work out in my garage, and so I, so I, I do it on the phone. I will say, on and off, I've used, some version of a video training for the maybe the last decade or so these are the best i mean they're the best organized they're the best shot the best production the best i mean they're they're they've outdone themselves you know in in the level of quality so i'm just looking forward to seeing where they go go ahead tj i got a free trial because i got one of the newer apple watches six months later i'm still doing it and yeah. i'm paying for it now they yeah, are well, really good and well, this is coming from a guy who went to the box, boxing gym three or four days a week. Right. Yeah, all, right, all right, so what's the quickest way to get it to my living room TV? That's what I wanted to know. Apple TV, get it on if you there? have one. Apple I don't TV. have an Apple TV. I have an Apple TV, but I don't want to use it. I just want to go. Well, if you, had a, if you have a TV with uh, Air, AirPlay, you AirPlay. may AirPlay. be able to AirPlay it from your phone or iPad. Okay, AirPlay. Yeah, you need air, you need the latest version of iOS AirPlay that'll go to a Roku, and of course, it's got to be the latest version of AirPlay too. So, uh, uh, I, I think Roku will will do that. Hey, go ahead, uh, Hosmer. Yeah, uh, tongue in cheek. I'm watching my TV every day, but this fitness thing just not in South Africa yet. So, oh really? We're kind of waiting. Yeah, like many other Apple stuff, HomePod is not available yet. Hmm. So. Interesting. Uh, next question. JHB in New York. What are panel using as in-ear monitors? Uh, go ahead, TJ, and then Rupert. I am using Ear Hero as my in-ear monitor. Mm. I'm currently using Ear Hero as well. Rupert? So normally I wear an IFB, but I had a problem with that today. And I just sometimes keep, I always keep some of these around 1050. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. I've been exploring with a lot of Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth five, because of the fact that the the connection's a lot better than Bluetooth four ever was, and the latency is low. I just got this uh, yesterday. This is actually a Bluetooth transmitter receiver. You can switch it back and forth. And the idea is, I'm going to put it with my wireless uh, microphone because we had a question a few days ago about a combo, and I was thinking of uh, doing that and see if the Bluetooth five works in a camera situation mm -hmm. when I get back to one on one interviews. Yep. Go ahead, John, and then Chad. I use Mi 3s uh, in ears. Uh, mm -hmm. They're about 35 bucks. Uh, they're on Amazon. Pretty okay, decent. Chad. Uh, Chad? I have used in ears and they uh, fit great. They sound a little light. And currently I'm using M6s um, mm -hmm. for about 20 bucks. Uh, you can see here they sound a little fuller, a little more present. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, go ahead, Leo. So I'm using M6s, but I've got my M6s Bluetooth. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I will never uh, do the audio setup of a show on them. I'll do those mm -hmm. always with, uh, with these. But once the show starts, I'll, I'll swap to the M6s because the M6s, uh, it's, the, it's the physical look is better yeah. than, the, than that. But the sound quality compared to that is just not even close. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, George? I've been using the audio implements for a year now. Well, since audio, since office hours begun, mm -hmm. and um, they're pretty comfortable. Uh, yeah. The cables are robust, so even if you snag them, you know the cable is still um, in good condition. Yep, Hasmuk, and then and then Ken. 
Yeah, I started off with Sidekick 1, now I'm using Sidekick 2 and connected to my Apollo Solo through the wirelessly through the Rode Go. Oh, interesting. Very good. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, I used to use the um, M6, but I, I've changed to the Shaw um, SC215s. I just find them more comfortable in the ear, but I connect them to the um, to this X5, so then the, I can use them wirelessly. Um, and has that been pretty clear? This, this has been, yeah, I'm, I'm really actually impressed with uh, the, the way this, how well these work. Yeah, That's great. Um, uh, TJ and then Mark. And uh, for Sky, just did a little love to the old um, Skull Candies that I used for six months here before I switched over to the uh, um, <laughs> Ear Heroes. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I'm also wearing an IFB from Audio Implements. And for the folks who may not be initiated with that or familiar with it, um, I believe they'll send you a free kit where you just make this little putty and you put it in your ear and molds to your ear specifically. Mm -hmm. This really helps hold it in. Um, so and in addition to that, you know, you've got the clip. Um, for example, Madeline, I think, it, yeah, it was up with Madeline. Before she got her current system, she was wearing some earbuds and they would fall out maybe into the food she was preparing or whatever. Right. Um, but it, yeah, about a hundred bucks for the complete chain for this. And you buy them in pieces, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, we buy those in sections. And so um, they're, they're, they're pretty good. Go ahead, Kai. Yeah, the um, Sennheiser IE40 Pros are $99, I want to say. And those come with the IEM 500 series. And uh, these work really well. Yeah, that's uh, great. Not bad for 100 bucks. What, sure are as well as... what are the ones that we're currently using? Sidekick 2s uh, on Madeline. Those are amazing. Those yeah, she phenomenal. raved about them. I mean, she, oh, they're I, amazing. I've never seen, I should shoot a testimonial with her. I mean, she was just so ecstatic about those. I, I, I think don't it was know, Nate too. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know who mentioned it here, but the, I, I, I now have on, on my, in my browser, a moon audio <laughs> click. Somebody talked about it here. When you guys talk about stuff, I'll type it in and just save it to my bookmarks of things that I, oh, I got to check that out. They have they have in ear monitors that are like thirty eight hundred dollars, and I'm just like I don't know what would make that difference. And the cables, they have cables that are five hundred dollars. Anyway, it's a, I'm pretty sure it was Nigel. Nigel, I think is the one that brought that up. All right, next question. Next one's coming in from Jason Sipe in Marietta. Showflow has a remote prompter feature that allows one to keep talent on time and script. Are there currently any better alternatives? How often are you using remote prompting in your productions? You know, I, I'm interested in using the Showflow one. We've used Showflow on a variety of shows in the past, um, and it's, it's it's pretty good. I actually want to get them on the show, and I've they watch Mac Break, and they've been involved in stuff before. So I've talked to them in, in the past, and they've been pretty gracious with us in the past and with Pixel Core and everything else. And so I, I, I want to get uh, get them on and have them explain some of those things. I, I will admit that we do prompting probably every show at this point. Um, that we that we do for for clients there's a prompting uh, element so we were using zoom to remotely broadcast the the teleprompter michelle who does most of our teleprompting is in uh colorado springs and so she she or part of her group <laughs> the people who are there um, they come in remotely one of the things that we have found though is that using obs ninja works better than zoom so the latency is slightly lower and Zoom tends to drag on screen shares. So the, the nature of how the stop start of graphics, because Zoom's trying to be efficient, we found actually is not good for teleprompting. And so the screen share, the screen share on Zoom will snag in a way that OBS Ninja doesn't. OBS Ninja doesn't look as nice. It, it actually gets more beat up but it always works and it's low latency and we're having less trouble with OBS Ninja. We just shifted over. We were using Zoom for everything. We were noticing, especially when someone had a not a great connection on the other side, we would get this where we would just freeze and then go. And obviously that doesn't work very well for what we were doing. And so we shifted that to that and we found that OBS Ninja, that's the one use that we have for OBS Ninja is to, is to do our teleprompting. Uh, go ahead, Jonas. And then, and then George. So do you use the normal video in OBS Ninja or do you use the, actual feature where you can send text. I don't know. I have to talk to Michelle about it. Michelle just goes, I'm just going to switch you over to OBS Ninja. Here's a link and boom, it was working. <laughs> so yeah, I just clicked on the link and it was like, whoop, and then we were, we were, we were on. So there are I, some custom built teleprompters, especially oh, right. for OBS Ninja, where you can 
actually uh, give a return feed and then overlay messages from the producer and all oh, wow. that. There are, yeah, it's a, a I don't developer know. build it. There is a lot of stuff hidden. I don't know at this point whether we would ever go back to putting the, the operator in, have them in person. Like it's, it, it works so well. I mean, once we got through that little snag, it works so well. It's like, why, why not have the best tel teleprompt operator that I can have, you know, wherever they are in the world and not have to worry about bringing them in or finding someone local or, you know, anything else that, you know, cause yeah, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it was an amazing shift for us. Uh, go ahead, George. So I'm glad you mentioned the uh, prompting because that's such a big part of production. So the guys here in DC that, that, that I use and they come in in Zoom or VMix, they have ATM minis. So it's a no brainer and it works perfectly. So they're just switching between themselves. When we need to talk to them, we could see them. When they need prompt, we just switch that different input and yep. that, that works pretty well. We've been putting switchers and ATEM switchers in line for our prompters for a long time, you know, because our primary use for prompters is actually just eyeline. You know, so we're mostly worried about eyeline, not not prompting. I, I try to I we use prompting every single show that we do. We do discourage it every single show that we do. Like we say, don't have people reading stuff, just have them talk. But that doesn't doesn't fly. <laughs> Next question. Next one's from Jonas Stadl in Reutlingen, Germany. For Office Hours 2.0, will the abstraction for controlling the hardware rise? And he has in quotes here, instead of controlling the ATEM and cut to input two, you cut to guy. Yeah, so um, we'll talk about this more. So Monday, by the way, is just going to be us talking. We're going to be, the second hour is us just messing around. <laughs> like it's just us, like it's, it's Memorial Day, so some people will come, some people won't, but it's literally going to be Nate just working on stuff and us working on things, and we're just going to figure it out. Like, hey, this is how we're going to do this, and then you're going to see it get better on Tuesday and better on Wednesday, and then we'll just on 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 Thursday. And, and um, uh, so you'll see us kind of pulling these, these graphics together and kind of figuring out, you know, how we want to do this. And Nate's going to be working on it full time next week to, to kind of tighten the whole thing up as we get ready for dub dub. And, um, and so, uh, so anyway, so what we want to do is get an integration both with Zoom OSC as well as um, Mukana. So the back end, for instance, one of the things I'm working on is is the back end of Mukana and the panelist view. People panelists will be able to raise their hand. Be, you know, they'll see the questions coming in, and then they raise. It, it won't be. It'll no longer be the teleprompter view. It'll just be a question, a panelist view. They can raise their hand like, "I want to ask that. I want to answer that question." Then the host will say, "You, you, and you." And then when we go to when we hit answer. The, the goal eventually is to have it drive the super source inside of the show. So the idea is that, that we start abstracting away from, you know, like so the whole thing just pops up and then we can, we can set up a bunch of behaviors that, that all tie together with that. That won't happen immediately. <laughs> so you won't like, but that's where we're going because that's going to, and then what we're talking, so Andy is going to come out and we're going to work on, Andy Carluccio is going to come out. We're going to be working on Zoom ISO where we're literally going to grab the entire panel and put, pull it into the constellation 1080p for every person, you know, so everyone's in the constellation. So now we have all of that there. Now we can build, um, you know, super sources and grids and, you know, a lot of other things that are all there. And so that's going to allow us to, again, I think, build a show that you, you, you're you right, Jonas, that we can't keep on switching and do, we can't trans, uh, you know, um, transcend broadcast by doing it by hand. So over the summer, you'll see us building more and more apparatus around it. Now, we're still going to be based in hardware for a variety of reasons, um, mostly that I work in HDR and immersive, and that doesn't work in the cloud right now. So, so until that gets solved, you know, because, um, you know, by the middle of the summer, my goal is to have us running at 4K, possibly us running at 4K HDR, you know, like possibly putting the folks into in the immersive, like folding it down for YouTube, but having the ability for you to listen to us and, and start to play around with a lot of those bits and pieces. And so, um, you know, like we've been, you know, we've been in cloak mode for a while. <laughs> so there's going to, you know, like we're going to come out of cloak. We're gonna, sometime, sometime in the summer, we're going to come out and we're going to, we're going to remove the cloaking. <laughs> and so, so the, uh, but for, you know, my, my end goal is a 4k HDR, you know, um, uh, Atmos show, you know, that's happening every day. You know, and so we, you know, as a group, the goal is that we get together and we create that. And, you know, we, I'm not interested in doing as well as broadcast and planning to leave them in the dust. Um, go ahead, Jonas. That's really the way that I want to, like, get forward with software. Because what I see when I work with volunteers, if I say uh, switch to input one, they're like, 
which is input one. Uh, oh. And if I like, we map out stream decks to have like wide shot presentation and like even more abstract, sometimes even audio stuff that you just are like, because it's easier to map and then suddenly it becomes available to people that don't need to practice a lot. Like if I change my routing, my interface changes, doesn't change for a volunteer. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and one of the things that, um, one of the things that we did with Hangouts, and we were very wily about it because you know, Google Google was like, how are you doing that? Like, like, like how is this working? Because then they were like, why don't we send some engineers up to talk? And we were like, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it next week. And then the next week we were like, oh, we're really too busy. So we didn't want to show anyone what we did, but we had basically tied Hangouts into our hardware. So we could actually run all your volumes through sliders. We were using these BSC 1000s or something from Behringer, these little motorized sliders, and, and we could click on things. And what we did, what we found, and this is the first step of when I realized that we had to, how to transcend this was to get it's it's kind of a cyborg <laughs> kind of show. It does not work to have the machine do all the work. It does not work to have the human do all the work. It really works when you blend them together. So one of the things that we did with Hangouts is we had what we called soft clicking um, or, or soft selects. So we'd say, we'd click on you, you, and you, and then that would tell the Hangout, because we, we wrote it right into the, into the API there. It would tell the Hangout only auto switch between these people. You know, so it only cut, there'd be 10 people there and nine people typically, and it would auto cut, but it would only auto cut, like these two people are talking, click, click. So if someone had made a random noise, it just never went to them and just ignored them. Um, and so, so it would look at that. And then we started getting into adding uh, attack and delay and decay. So I can decide for each person, <laughs> when do I, when do I auto cut to them? You know, because they have different styles. And so you can have little dials that are just tuning that up. And so when you start going into that, into that, in, you know, into that process, you ended up with a much better show than anything that a person or a machine can do. And because the, the machine could respond faster than a human can, you know, but you didn't want it to get, but it also gets distracted and goes the wrong way all the time. And so it's the mix of that. And so that's what we're going to start turning up the dial. Um, and again, a human can't handle, you know, we have 16 to 20 panelists every day or 16 to 24 panelists every day. A human can't keep up with that you know, on, on their own. Um, and that's why shows don't do that. <laughs> you know, and broadcast, that's why broadcasters are going to look at what we're doing and they're going to like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Like, you know, like we're going to have things that look like nice super sources, except it's randomly grabbing all those things. And again, the goal is, is that we're all going to work on it together. We're all going to learn how to do it together. And then we're all going to use it in our shows. Like, it's not a matter of, you know, that's the other thing is that, you know, the, the goal is it's kind of open source, not open source, but open source within us to figure this out and to push all these envelopes up so that these shows all start, they'll all, you know, if, if we're successful, they'll all start popping out in the fall. It's not just going to be office hours. Office hours is just a lab. Now, we're going to move on because we were way, you know, we were going really slow because it's for the producers. I just want to say we go really slow because you don't ask a lot of questions and then you ask them all at the end and then we have to go really fast. We'll, we'll go a little into next hour because uh, so for, if you're the educators, just know that we're going to go a little, little heavy, but we're going to speed up here. All right, next question. Mark Horner asked, when watching office hours, I've noticed a very brief but significant loss in video quality at times when a panelist switches source. For example, when sharing a screen, then switching to the webcam, degradation lasts less than a second, but I often notice it cause of this. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Leo. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, I haven't got my headphone on. Sorry, my fault, my fault, my <laughs> fault. Um, so I had to walk away and I forgot to put it on. The, it's very clever from Zoom. Zoom is actually uh, spending a huge amount of time optimizing what it's sending, what it's receiving. So for any single time, if you watch, you'll see that as people will do less and less talking, they'll degrade down and down and down unless somebody pins them. If somebody's pinning them or spotlighting them, then they'll go up. The best thing to do is watch your own uh, settings. If you go into your settings and your, uh, you can actually see uh, the how uh, much you're sending and how much you're receiving. Um, to to its benefit this is to your benefit i have done an event with somebody who's lives on the isle of sky which is at the top of scotland they live down the end of somewhere where for them to get a mobile signal to be able to be it to get the six digit code on something they have to walk 10 minutes to get that enough signal to get a six digit code on there but they've got less than a meg internet and we were able to do a really successful event yes they were probably running around about eight frames a second but it was enough to be able to get a show out and and the first thing that when you cut to someone new, unless, and if they, to, to Leo's point, if someone pin them, or if they are full screen somewhere, they'll immediately come in at full res. If they 
come from the panel, what Zoom does is immediately gives you the video of what it already had, which is this little 320 by whatever. I'm going to give you that, and then I'm going to step up. You know, I'm going to step up really fast. And and Hangouts did that for a long time, too. If you watch old Hangouts, you'll see the same thing. I'm going to throw you the low res, what I have available to me at the moment. I'm going to send instantly what Zoom used to do, which was, to me, super annoying. I'll send you the last frame that 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 they were that I had full res of them, and then I'll immediately come after it. So there was this weird glitch in front of every person in the early pandemic days, and now they've gone to this kind of progressive throw. Now, what you'll find interesting about both what, what happens inside of Zoom when we talk about the Zoom ISO thing is that we'll be pulling full res of everybody. <laughs> it's gonna be very expensive for, I mean, it's a very expensive stream because like everybody will be at full res all the time. Uh, so it won't be very efficient, but there won't be that many of them. Um, next question. Next one's coming in from our friend Charles Klein in New York City. Does the panel have experience with TVU live streaming? A colleague reached out to me and I'm reaching out to those I trust. They have a live stream on June 6th and need assistance. I, I would I would rate TVU from our experience as kind of the third best cellular solution. So there's TVU, um, there's DeGero, second best, and LiveU is the best in my opinion. Um, we've had a lot of trouble with TVUs, <laughs> like, like really bad experiences with TVUs. So I've had a couple bad experiences with DeGero and and very few. I mean. You know, my, my most of my experiences with LiveView because I used to lease two of them with uh, ex an extender. So, um, so I have a lot of experience with it. But the TVUs, the big experiences are bad enough that I, like we kind of left with. I'm never going to use that again. And then we do it because we couldn't get a hold of one, and then we get end up with it again, and, and it just always, you know, blew up. You know, eventually. Uh, go ahead, guy, and then Jonas. Yeah, we were looking at some of their other options. Um, the uh, party line that they have, I've heard, is like a secret weapon that a lot of people have been using. Uh, there was a TVU producer. Uh, that's an, another option that we were looking at for um, cloud production. They mm -hmm. use AWS, and there's actually a free um, trial that you can eat up a, mm -hmm. like a hundred hours or something like that. It's 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 really cool. I was super excited when I, when I first saw it, but then it was almost too simple. Um, as yeah. far as a device, I was pretty excited the other day. I got hit with a Facebook ad with them. They said 4K HDR, 5G live streaming out of this box. But after hearing you, I don't know how much I want to trust Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between features. It's features and, and, and usability are two different things. And so they, you know, a lot of times they get into the situation where they, yeah, sure, they, they on paper, it can do those things. It doesn't mean they can do it well. Um, and, you know, maybe we can test it again. But again, our experiences have been rough enough that we've, uh, we haven't used it for a while. So next question. Next one's coming in from Gordon Lake. To help others with remote productions, what gear should someone have? Example, networking gear, controllers, et cetera. Bandwidth. <laughs> like bandwidth. You know, like that's that's the number one thing that you'll need to, to be to be able to do it is make and I would say what we're gonna start with is like, hey, we need, you know, we're gonna ask, probably ask people more detail about their bandwidth and what to decide what they can and can't do. For people that were hiring remotely, we're eventually going to require two independent internet connections. You know, like so, like if we're going to hire you to run an event on our, you know, for a big what we're doing, we're going to want you to, we're going to want to know what your bandwidth is for both connections into the house. Um, you know, and so, and I think we all sh should start thinking about primary and backup connections. If we're going to work from home, we have to treat it like work, you know, and so I think that's the thing that we're going to kind of uh, expect from folks. We'll probably expect for people eventually who are working us. Because I, I expect to have, I don't expect to ever go back to the whole crew being in the office. And so part of the summer project is to identify more people that can do this for us and also um, figure it all out. But I think that the other things we'll expect are all your equipment's on UPS, all your equipment. This is for professional. For us playing around over the summer, you know, we'll, we'll keep on playing with it. But, but for when we start saying we're going to hire people somewhere in the world, we want to know that everything's on UPS, that everything is, you know, that, that you've tested all those things that even you might, we might eventually require generators, <laughs> you know, like, like those kinds of things. Again, professional tools for professional ex execution, if we're going to export that capability. And that would be only for key pieces like the audio engineer and the TD. And there's, you know, there's some places that you could have a couple different backups and it wouldn't matter. But as we start having someone like Nate's cutting the Mad in the Kitchen show from Salt Lake City in San Francisco and um, from his office and it, you know, it's working well, but I always go, well, <laughs> I, I, I worry a little bit if I was, if, if this was a paid gig. Now go ahead, Leo, and then Chad. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree on UPSs, uh, but we're in the UK. We don't need generators. Our power doesn't fail. 
<laughs> oh, I can't believe you just said that. Anyway, and we, then we, knock on we wood paid, everywhere we, all we, around we, you. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like, we, oh, we, man. No, we, we invested okay. in infrastructure. <laughs> you know that all of us, if, if, if you lose any power in the UK in the next year, you're just going to get a whole bunch of pictures from us of all the articles. Like, oh, right, it never, it never fails. <laughs> Go ahead, Chad. Uh, the question mentions controllers as well, and controllers is a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. And we're, <laughs> we're, we're looking at a lot of different things here. Like we want something that's sturdy and can really take a lot of pushing and can be labeled. This APC Mini can't be labeled very well, but it's got faders on it, so it's valuable. Stream Deck, I can push over a network and do all kinds of crazy things with. Uh, this silly thing is, is just a godsend because it's so cheap and gives me four sources. Uh, loop deck is another one that I've been experimenting with a lot. I think uh, I'm I'm talking to their engineers about being able to do color grading with these handy dandy right. little knobs, which is going to be fantastic. So yeah. just it's it's whatever kind of workflow that that yeah. that you're used to. I'd just Absolutely. like to introduce my new best friend. His name is Chad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're we're gonna move really quickly because we're running out of time. Next question. Carmi Vineswig, clarifying my question from yesterday, what pre-made products would people recommend for use as prompters slash interatrons with BMD Pocket 6K and or Ursa Minis at 500, 2500, 5000 to 6000? And he has a note here that he's primarily looking for fixed use, not as part of a fly kit. Also, if it, uh, if it is iPad based and can work with an older iPad that costs, does not need to be included. Everyone for whom I am thinking of these has enough older devices to repurpose. Uh, Brian. So I have not used this and I, I don't know if it's a new product, but I just ran into it a couple of days ago and it's from prompter people and they have something called the desktop free fly single arm teleprompter. It's a 24 inch prompter with the screen. So the reversing is built in mounted on a visa arm. So this thing can float around and move wherever. And I, again, I just ran into it for the first time. It looks really cool. I'd take a look at it. I'll drop a, a link. We've owned 10 or 12 uh, prompter, prompter people, prompters, 24 inch, 15 inch. Um, I use a, the ones we ship out now are, are the 12 inch mobile eye cans just cause they're inexpensive and small, about 800 bucks. Um, but the, uh, the prompter people one are the ones that I have the most experience with. Um, the, the glass is thin, which is great, but the glass does not, I don't ship it <laughs> cause it breaks a lot. Now go ahead, Jeffrey. Two quick ones. Uh, Parrot makes a under hundred dollar version of a teleprompter that would work with an iPad. And then Padcaster actually makes a very small one. It's meant for the padcaster, but a lot of people have been, if you have the right lens, you can put it right onto the onto the uh, lens and, and use it that way. You'll always end up wanting to have a, uh, maybe not always, but 99% of the time, <laughs> you'll want, you'll wish you had a monitor. I mean, you can start with the iPad, but eventually you'll want a monitor. Um, next question. Brian Anderson, Silver Spring, Maryland. I may be doing a job in a few months using HD tptopia.io, yet another virtual world or conference app. Does anyone here have any experience with it? Has anyone seen it? Yet another one. Yet another production company who has decided to try to <laughs> pivot. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, but the, uh, let's see if it, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> Again, I, I, when we talk about authentic communication, I just don't know. I, I, when people say this, I, my, my brain is always like, I just don't understand why we're not doing this in Zoom. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like I haven't, you know, like it's, it's hard for me to get my, my head back around it. Maybe I'm just old fashioned, but, but I, I feel like a lot of those things work. I think that um, the things that I'm most interested in, I, I think that a lot of these things keep on coming back to, hey, we can make it look just like the physical world or, or create this physical world experience. We can go backwards into the cave and you can, you can have that experience. <laughs> and so I, I'm... Uh, Paul. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at here, but that really bothers me. Um, uh, go ahead, Leo. Um, the biggest thing we keep on coming across is that is where people want is some control of the breakout rooms, which feels more intuitive and flexible than it is under Zoom. I think that's the bit that we keep on hitting and, up against. And what do they want in the breakout room? They want the ability to be able to shift people around and then be able to shift people from sh from a breakout to a breakout so that you end up with this cascading effect 
um, uh, that you're in, if you imagine you're in a big room and in a big environment and you say, right, we're now going to split off into our, our sessions. And when we're in our sessions, the people in the sessions nested are going split. To, yeah. It's the nested exactly. breakout. That is the thing. And, I, I will agree with you. That is yeah. like, I've really identified nested breakout is one of the most important things Zoom could add. And, and you we, know, it's, we, we did it in Gathertown and it was absolutely amazing. It was mm -hmm. absolutely amazing and I can demo it. And um, we did an absolutely amazing gather town environment with nested breakouts. But you, I know where you're going to go, Alex. You sort of landed on that 2D uh, uh, Commodore 64 ZX right. Spectrum view, and you probably pressed the bounce button before it even rendered. I won't. I won't do any of this stuff. I just want the video and talk to people. I don't need. I don't need all the other stuff. You know. I think that's the problem. Is that I just I won't interact interact with it. That's why I don't know any of these because because I just go. I see it. I see what they're going to use and I immediately just go, I'm not going to do that. You know, like I just, I just want the video. Right, go ahead, Brian. I guess that's what's interesting about this is that people can wander from place to place or, you know, move themselves. And there are other things that do this already, but that it was one of these things my mm -hmm. boss saw it and it's like, we should do this. Go, oh, here we go. But yeah, yeah I, 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 yeah. I mean, there's definitely gonna be a population that wants to wander around in, in some kind of skeuomorphic mess. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of a, a generational thing. I think that somehow I'm, uh, you know, just because I, I think a lot of us that are close to digital nat native that have been doing this, I mean, I was on online forums in the mid 80s, you know, so I don't have a different, I, I can virtual, I can visualize where I am in a different way than I think most people, most people think about. And so maybe they need the skeuomorphic stuff, but uh, I find it to be uh, annoying. Um, go ahead, uh, Jason, and then JJ, real quick. We're gonna we're gonna move forward. Yeah, fifteen seconds. Um, the thing I've noticed most about uh, education is that people want to have inside of breakout rooms just like one on one conversations, and it's been very difficult to be able to break into those one on one conversations from a breakout room. So any company out there that's trying to fix that problem might have a leg up in some instances on Zoom. Yeah. Again, nested breakouts um, and dynamic breakouts, which is hey, let's go talk together and have it go out. I think I think is something. Those are the those. I will agree that those are the key things that Zoom is missing right now. Go ahead, JJ, real quick, fifteen seconds. Looking at the immersive thing, video games. Lots of video games have that fully immersed, and then you can be close to someone and then leave. It's it's a game though. Yeah, I don't like those either. <laughs> but but it's okay. It's just me. That 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 stuff's just me. I I just don't like it. I, when I play games, I don't want to interact with them. My kids do. I just I don't. Next question. Mark Bridges and Covina, is it possible to get video in and out of the new iPad Pro? I think Alex was curious a while back, as am I, if it could be used for telestration as an alternative to the Wacom Cintiq. Go ahead, Ken, and then Peter. Yes, I can. Um, well, I'm using the I'm using the older iPad, um, mm. and that can that can be used straight as a telestrator um, right now. So it's uh, yeah, definitely. Um, Definitely an easy telestration device, as I'm badly demonstrating here. <laughs> go ahead, Peter. Oh, wait. Well, you're doing it that way, but the video can't go in. Yeah, and that's what oh. I was going to say is oh. there's the, the, the reality is you can do video out. You've always been able to do video out out of the iPads, but video in, they've not opened up that path yet. Yeah. Um, even though certainly now with USB-C, there's, with USB C and with and with an M1 chip, it, it's got all the horsepower to do it, it. It's got everything it needs to do. They just Except need to decide interface. to do it. <laughs> yeah, just an interface is all it's missing at this point. Um, last question. Last one coming in from Leo Mendel. 4K. Does Zoom support it? No. Not that I know of. When I say I'm gonna go 4K, it's because I can build a 4K show that has us as 1080p inserts. So we'll still be scaled up if we're full screen. But imagine all the super sources and everything else operating inside of 4K and, and any graphics or video playback or other things that we're doing. And, and to get back into that, think about the inserts that we put in being 4K HDR. You know, so we can, you know, like I'm going to show you a piece of a movie or some something we're shooting. That can be even live. It can be HDR, even vision. Um, and then we come in and we would be promoted to... Uh, you know, we'd scale, be scaled up for full screen, but a lot of the stuff will still be some, some kind of super source. So the core going out will be at 4K, um, but the but we will be 1080p sources for now. Go ahead, Rupert. So not for video, but if you screen share a uh, high resolution, um, yep. you'll get like one frame a second at 4K. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And the thing that we generally prefer, in fact, we were, I was just talking with someone else is that is just getting the, uh, I really like the zoom room feature of being able to pull both the person and the screen share out and then put it into our switcher so that now we can cut back and forth and do picture in picture. And we're going to, we'll be doing that. Like for instance, in the Isadora, um, second hour next week. All right. So we, we've gotten through it. If you're a educator and you want to be part of the brainstorming panel, um, and if you have other questions, we'll start the, we'll start the, the hour, uh, or the half, hour. <laughs> we'll start on the half hour. Uh, we're gonna give everybody a little bit of a break. Um, and, and we'll go through uh, mic checks. Um, but if you want to be part of the brainstorming, and if you want to, if you have questions about education, ask them right now, we're going to go through mic checks, but ask those questions, um, right now so that, uh, We'll start with those questions and then we'll get, we'll dig back into it. We're going to go ahead and um, stop the recording. Um, let's see here. I guess Sky has to do that. Bye bye. And um, Sky, are you cutting? Is that right? You were cutting? Who was cutting? No, I'll be handing it to Tony, but let but me hand you, need to, let me, yeah, let me hand you the, the host. Recording. Let okay, me hand. You, can, you can hand me the host. Handing you the host. Three, two, 